the tipping point. So In the meantime, please just uh, prepare your question number. I do need you just, I simply ask you to uh, put the number in our night group so I will know that it's your questions. And remember, anyone pop up a questions on the, on the pra throughout the practice, you will get a zero two, zero point two five uh, academic score as a bonus to encourage you to participate. Okay, now we have uh, the other classroom online, so let's uh Okay, so now let's open the, the question. Are you please just uh, type here the number of your questions here. Okay, if you have any number that you want to clarify uh, why it is in, the, in such a way to answer, just uh, type the, in the question here. Now please, hurry up. <coughs> don't be shy, I don't ask you to, yeah, okay, thank you for, uh, <coughs> okay. <coughs> Okay, let's start with, uh, you, you can continue to type in your question number and uh, I will see how much time we have and uh, I will do this one by one. So let's go to the first one, uh, question nine. Uh, please go to question nine. Okay, let's see this one. So basically, how can we identify the structure of the sentence? Uh, this is very important for us to understand the grammatical structure. So if you look at number nine, so here we have the subject, right? This, this is subject. So this is a verb, argued six women's right cases. So basically, we have uh, complete the sentence structure already. This is a subject and this verb, chastity verb, and this is, the, this is the object, right? So this is a modifier. So the modifier is uh, the verbio, fu zi pian yu, ji zi pian yu, action as a uh, adverb. So this is used to modify argue. So basically, we can take this away without any harming of the structure, okay? So look here. Since we have the complete structure already, this, the first one is subject, this is the verb, and this is the object, right? Okay? So we have the comma here, and everything here should not be a sentence structure. It can be a modifier. A modifier can be a non-adjective or a adverb. So let's see this one. Which one can be a modifier? I believe that this is only one winning file of them. It's the only modifier we can choose. Who win? Of course, this one win, right? So if we want to extend the sentence into two, into two, we can do this. The first one is Ruth Bader Ginsburg argued six women's right cases before the United Supreme Court in the 1970s. And uh, we can put a period here. Period here. And another sentence will start with she won five of them. Is that right? So we just omit she won and uh, replace it with winning. So this is the only answer we can have. It's very simple. So what is the trick 
of understanding the structure. As I always em emphasize, it's very important to identify the structure. The structure here is very clear. This is subject, right? And this is the verb. And this is the object. Remember, it's not six women's rights cases. This is the noun phrase. But if we determine this as the core of the grammatical structure, the only subject, the only object is cases. Because rights, although it is a noun, but it is a modifier for cases. What kind of cases? Rights cases. What kind of rights cases? Human women's rights. How many? Six. Okay. So basically over here, starting from six women's rights are used to modify cases. So they are modifier. So they cannot be the object. The only qualified object is cases. Okay. So now subject, verb, and the object. All the others are modifiers. They are not so important, so they can be taken away. So this is number nine, and I will go forward to number three. Number three, let's move up a little bit, Thomas Penn. So still, we try to identify the structure, right? So Thomas Penn wrote Common Sense, the end of the structure. Did you see this one? This, this is the subject, right? And this is the verb. And of course, this is the object. This is a transitive verb, transitive verb. So subject wrote common sense, the end of the story. So let's look at a pamphlet that identified the American colonies with the cause of liberty. So this one is a noun phrase used to modify common sense. So basically, it is a positive, a positive, it refers to common sense. So pamphlet is a noun, right? So common sense is the book name, the title of the book. So basically, a pamphlet, what kind of pamphlet? That identify the American colonies with the cause of liberty. So basically, this one, a positive, can be taken away. There's no problem for this one. So Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, right? But we still have something here. Thomas Paine, and we notice that there's a comma, and the comma here, right? It indicates we are using the blank here to modify Thomas Paine. So who is Thomas Paine? Basically, it is an eloquent writer. Writer is a noun, right? So this is a noun phrase equal to Thomas Paine. So who Thomas Paine is? Thomas Paine is an eloquent writer. So this is a, another a positive, Tong Wei Yu, again. So basically we can see, we can take this away, right? So the core structure for the sentence is Thomas Paine wrote common sense. That's it. Okay, let me enlarge all of this. Get back to all of this. And you can see from here. Although we have a very long sentence here. Thomas Paine, comma, an eloquent writer, comma, wrote common sense, a pamphlet that identified the American colonies with the cause of liberty. Although we see the sentence is such a long one, right? But actually, the core components for this one is only three. That is Thomas Paine, subject, wrote, transitive verb, and uh, common sense. All else are used to modify the major component of the sentence. Thomas Paine is modified by an eloquent writer. And uh, common sense is modified by a pamphlet. Then the pamphlet is modified by that identify the American colonies with the cause of liberty. So remember, how can you identify the main structure of the sentence? Very simple. What are the core components? Exit. So here we have three. Thomas Paine wrote common sense, right? 
So if you know this, that will be all else will be very very simple. Okay, for example, can I just extend the sentence by using the same structure here? Yes, of course. Look here, Thomas Paine, an American writer, born in 1950, which is wrong, right? 1950 and from southern Mississippi River, wrote Common Sense. Do you see that? Although I have added in a very long modifier, but it is only a declaration. You can take it away. You can take it away. So don't miss all of the sentence. Sentence does not need to be very long. No. The most important things for writing English is to keep it concise, precise, to the point, direct. Okay, this is a very important idea. So some students have been trained throughout the high school education that you have to write a very arrogant sentence to earn a higher points, which is a very wrong idea. Don't do that. You don't have to. You don't have to. Okay, so let's move to any questions so far. If not, let's move to number 12. Okay, so let's look here the sentence structure. Again, we try to understand. So the chip sources of B12, then we have seen this, uh, what, I, I, let me put this one with a comma, so it's a good, uh, good time to change. So look here, the chip, chip sources of B12, and we see another modifier, right? Uh, water soluble, soluble vitamin, and stored in the body, and this is another comma, which means we can easily identify the section here is used to modify B12. So this is an adjective. Fine. And include, this is a verb, right? So it includes three things, meat, milk, and eggs. So this all together is the object. So the problem here, which one is the subject for question number 12? Which one? So now let me ask you here, Okay, uh, I'm going to use this as a roll call and you need to provide the answer for this one. Which one is the soul, the subject for question 12? You have to type in. If you don't do anything, then you are not here, okay? Don't just copy in the past. This may be wrong. <laughs> okay, hurry up. I'm going to end the roll call in 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one and the end. Okay, so which one is the, is the subject? Basically, sources. Sources is the subject, not the chief. Okay, what kind of sources? Chief sources. So chief is used to modify sources. What kind, which, which chief sources? The chief sources, right? So the most important word here is sources. What kind of sources of B12? B12, B12 is a prepositional phrase. So prepositional phrase is used to modify noun, then this prepositional phrase is served as an adjective, right? So look here. 
what are the main components for the sentence here? Basically, sources and uh, include verb and uh, object, meat, milk, and eggs. So this is the main structure. But we need to answer, provide answer for this blanks, right? So let's see this one. This is a water-soluble vitamin and uh, stored. So basically, we need to identify, we need to have something that is capable of uh, using to modify vitamin. So which one is able to do the job? Basically this one, right? That is not. So that is not stored in the body, it's an adjective clause. 形容词子句. So it is used to modify vitamin. Okay, so this is the answer for this one. Okay, so let's continue to... Uh, we still have five more minutes, then uh, 25. Okay, so for each enzyme reaction, there is an optimal temperature which maximum efficiency is achieved. So let's see this one. This one is a little bit tricky because it is the inverse sentence structure. The first one we need to identify still is the subject, right? So which one is the subject? The subject is temperature. The verb is is. And uh, the subject complement is there. There. So basically, an optimum temperature is there. The real, the normal sequence of the sentence is an optimal temperature is there. So temperature is the subject, is is the be verb, and there is the subject complement, okay? And now, let's see this one. So basically, we have complete the structure. So for each enzyme reactions, we have finished this, right? So basically, this would be better with a comma here. There's an optimal temperature. Now, we need to think about this one. This one is wrong. Temperature which, because we know, if we use which, which is used to modify temperature. But we have to look at, what we need here is that we are using the temperature to achieve the maximum efficiency. So basically, what we need here is to put a width here, so for each enzyme reaction, comma, there is an optimal temperature with which maximum efficiency is achieved. Why we use with? Because with the temperature, the meaning is equal to with the temperature, we can achieve the maximum efficiency. So can we write this sentence into two sentences? Yes. Let's look at this. For each enzyme reaction, comma, there is an optimum temperature, period. Maximum, efficient, maximum efficiency is achieved with the temperature. See, with the temperature, which refers to temperature, right? So. Maximum efficiency is achieved with temperature. So that's why we need to put a with before here. So the answer is here. Okay, so we still have one minute to go, and uh, I think that let's go to number 17. Okay. 
So let's say that wood from the ash tree becomes extremely flexible, not flexibly, because it becomes is a linking verb, which means that flexible is equal to tree, or equal to wood. So when it is exposed to steam. So let's try to identify the structure here. This is the subject, right? And it becomes is the linking verb. And the flexible, not flexibly, flexible. For example, you become beautiful. You cannot say you become beautifully. No, because beautiful is you, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so let's finish here. And the bonus will award to uh, the student pop up the first few questions in until 17. Okay, thank you very much. And let's take a 10 minutes break and come back again. We will resume our class for lesson two. Come back and uh, the tipping point, lesson two. And this one is kind of interesting. Everyone wants to follow some kind of trend or fashion. Or you want to uh, in the time, but not out of the time, right? So we are living in the 21st century. There are a lot of different factors or very, uh, very different issues out there that can attract you. So who can be or which one can be the tipping point to make the world change? There must be some sort of commonality out there. So let's learn about this today. So let's... Uh, what's So the outline of the lecture for today is very simple. We still go on the main structure, main context of the reading for today. The first one is what is the common? What is common between the rice or hush puppies and the fall of crime in New York? So have you ever heard the brand hush puppies? Hush puppies. It's a, it's a dog, right? It's a very cute dog. And uh, the store uh, sells a lot of shoes, a lot of uh, t-shirts, and very old-fashioned, but very cute. Okay, so what is common between the rise of hush puppies? We say the rise of hush puppies, and also the fall of New in New York City, the crime, the fall of crime rate in New York City. So basically, there are two events here. And after we highlight the major context of the readings, we will move on to uh, talk about English etymology and also the sentence structure, of course. And I, I will tell you how to accomplish your assignments. But other than that, especially for today, uh, on October 12th, uh, our students are going to take a standardized English proficiency test. You are part of the group, and uh, if, you, you, if your score reach a certain point, you will get a reward for, I believe that $3,000 for each student, I think. I'm not so sure, but I think there's a, a, a reward for you to take if your scores reach some certain points. But I'm not so sure, but later, after we finish our main course, I will select two groups. Each group will have 30 students. So we have 81 students, and uh, if you are coming from native English-speaking country, you will be exempt for the selection. If you are not, then you will be included. And later I will random, randomize uh, the selection of these two subgroups. And each group will have 30 students. Okay? If you want to volunteer, of course, you can say that later. Okay, let's move to the next. Well, so strange.
Sorry, get, uh, just give me some minutes. It's strange. Gus Stock here. Okay, let's resume our class. Okay, now it's become normal. So what is common between the rise? So we are going to talk two cases here. That is a real case. The first one, let's talk about this one, the rise of hush puppies. This is the brand. Uh, you can use your, your cell phone now to check out, uh, put key in the keywords hush puppies. The brand hush puppies. Now, hurry up, check it out. To give, you, give yourself some ideas about the brand Hush Puppies. So on the first page of your search, you, sh you should be able to see the bad set, the dog, right? So <laughs> that's a cute. This is a trademark of this one. So Hush Puppy basically is an American brand of casual footwear. Uh, the company sold a lot of shoes. Okay, so you get an idea, right? But remember this, Hush Puppies was not so popular before. Let's look at here, its story. So Hush Puppies, Hush Puppies sold only 30,000 pairs of its brushed suede shoes in late 1994. So let's look about uh, 25 years ago, and uh, it's more than 25 years ago. Yeah, 26, 27 years ago, right? So in the United States, it, it, it was able to sell only 30,000 pairs of its brushed shoes, suede shoes. So if you were the CEO of Hush Puppy, what would you do? The reasonable choice for you is to suspend the production. Just stop it, okay? Don't waste the resources of the company anymore. So Warfarin, at that time, this is the company. So Warfarin, the company, the company considered just facing it out then at that time completely. There's no use to continue the manufacturing process. Overall, because it only is only capable of selling thirty thousand pairs. Okay. However, this is keywords here. Mysteriously, ooh, spooky. How spooky it is! People suddenly rushed into ma and pa stores to buy the shoes, and the Warfarin sold. 430,000 pairs in 1995. Let's look at the number here. In 1994, in late 1994, the sale figure is only 30,000 pairs. But in 1995, it sold up to more than 11 times. More than that, so this is 430,000 pairs of the shoes. That's amazing, right? So if you were the CEO at this time, you would say, why? <laughs> we, did not, we did nothing to promote the shoes, right? But people just suddenly rushed into ma and pa stores to buy those shoes. So strange. And more mysteriously, one year later, in 1996, the selling figure reached an all-time high of 1.8 million pairs, four times of the previous years. And afterwards, even more. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's a very lucky business, right? So let's think about the possibility. The first one, it starts just in 1994, 30,000 pairs of the shoes. And then one year later, it reached 430,000 pairs. And a year, one year later, it reached 1.8 million pairs. And afterwards, even more. Who did this? Why people suddenly rushed into ma and pa stores to buy the shoes, which is almost outdated and outfaced, faced out by Warfarin, the company? 
Okay. So this is the story for the rise of hush puppies. Okay. Suddenly, just explode, right? Let's see the other one. The fall of crime rate in New York. I have been li I lived in New York uh, sometime between 1995, 1995 and 1997, almost two years I lived there. So I lived there when I was there, the crime rate was already down a little bit, but still very high. So you would not walk on the street during the night. It's too scary. People were just shooting and yelling and shouting, and maybe using a knife to cut, in, to cut each other. I, I, I'm not exaggerating, just that bad. You don't want to go into a crime street during the night of New York City. That is very dangerous. The first time I went to New York City was in 1988. Wow. You know, the first time I went there, I went into uh, Broadway. I tried to, uh, uh, there's a Times Square. You, there's a name is there, right? Times Square. And I walk, uh, walked across the street, and one African-American just rushed on me and pushed me. And uh, his wine bottle dropped on the floor, and he accused me, why you did do this, and you have to pay me. I said, no, police, <laughs> because uh, police is everywhere, it's there. So at that time, I was secured by the police force. But now, when I reflect that happening, I was kind of spooky. You know, what? Strange, right? I, walk, I'm, I was just a very simple, common pedestrian walking on the street. And then people would just rush on to me and drop a bottle and ask me to pay him. Crime city, <laughs> New York, right? New York crime city. So the fall of crime rate in New York, let's see the story. So let's see, not very long ago, in the 1980s, <laughs> that was where I was there, 1980s and the early 1990s, Bronxville and the East New York were turning into ghost towns at dusk when the sun sets and the crime rise. The criminals will walk crawl out of their houses and walk on the street and trying to find out some victims to rob, to kill, maybe, right? So basically at that time, no one will walk on the street during the night. So we say if it turned into a ghost tongues. My goodness, so dangerous, right? So look here, in 1992, we still have some figure here. In 1992, uh, there were 2,154 murders and 626, 626,182 serious crimes in New York City alone. Murders, which means people die, right? More than 2,000 people die on the street. And uh, there are also countless of, of, of uh, theft, of stealing, of other pep crimes are happening on the street. So that was serious. But look here. Five years later, five years later, the number dropped from 2,154 to 770. And uh, the number of serious crimes almost cut half to only 355,893. So you can see this uh, significant drop of the crime rate in New York City in just five years, right? And now again, previously it was a ghost town at dusk. But now the sidewalks filled up again with kids and the old folks. That was good, right? That's a harmonious society that everyone should live in. We love to uh, stand on the street and say, oh, what a good life, right? Without, without worrying about the bullet that might flow, fly over your head. My goodness, that I need to hide. So that should be a good life. So New York becomes a good city again. 
crime, not necessarily crime free, but at least less crime. That is good. So we have seen two occasions. One is the rise of hush puppies. In just one, one and one another years, we saw, we saw the sale of the hush puppy shoes starting from 430,000 to millions, right? And the crime rate in New York City started from the almost two, more than 2,000 people died in two, 1992, and after five years, the number cut into around 700. Well, that was quick, but that was mysterious too. There must be some causes make these changes, right? So let's try to explore. So let's go to the hush puppies case. Who propelled the sale? Who made this? You know, if you really want to uh, promote your product, if anyone here running an online store, you will know it was very, it is very difficult, right? If you want to sell something to others online, Wow, you need to put a lot of money to, uh, to have a promotion, uh, provide a lot of incentives, right? But for the case of hush puppies, <coughs> it seems that no one is doing the business. Okay, so here. The first question we need to ask is who prepared the sale of hush puppies? I don't know, uncertain. I have no idea at all, so strange. How strange it is. Here, First one, no one ever tried to promote this sale. No one ever tried to do this. Of course, there are some stimulus. The first one, the first time we see some few kids in the East Village and the Soho. Started to wear hush puppies. Those, those kids started to wear those hush puppies. They did not, actually, they did not aim to promote the shoes at all. Why they want to wear this kind of old-fashioned shoes? Very simple. Just because no one else would wear them. We are different, <laughs> right? That is cool. See, no one else wear this, so let's do this. So let's just do this. And remember, when they chose, when they chose to wear hush puppy shoes, do they, did they try to promote this? No, they don't. They had no idea. They just well, they are unique, they are different, okay? And the two fashion designers, there are two fashion designers involved in the evolution of the sale of hush puppies. One is John Bartlett, and the other was Anna Shea. Use the shoes to petal haute couture. Haute couture is a high-end lady dress. So look here. They just try to sell their dress, but not the shoes. But they only use the shoes to walk on the catwalk to show off, right? So the shoes was a, were an incidental touch. Incidental, incident means event. Because of the event, so they use it, right? So look here, we have kids wearing the shoes. We have the fashion designers using the shoes to sell their dress. So basically, the shoes are not the primary focus at all. They are not primary focus. Okay, however, the fad started and they explode. The process is kind of mysterious. The kids and the designers. So the first time in Los Angeles, the designer Joe Fitzgerald put a 25 foot inflatable basket but say it's the dog, right? It's a, it's a balloon, <laughs> a dog, 25 long, 25 feet long, a huge one, just hanging on the roof of the, of the so-called roof of his Hollywood Hush Puppies Boutique. Boutique is some store selling high-end product, okay? So this is the first store. So look here, wow, that's a high quality, right? So it must be some kind of fashion. So it seems like a, a seed put into a very high quality nutrient uh, uh, board so that it can grow well. And the next one, when its store was still under renovation, look here, not open yet. 
not open yet. Oh, by the way, you could have the PPT file in our, through our night group. I have put that one day before, so you can just take it out. If you want to preview the context, you can go there, right? And you will find out the, the layout of the PPT reflect the major structure of the readings. So you can use this to read your readings. That would be very helpful. As I mentioned before, this is not a traditional reading class. I will not teach you, say, let's read uh, in LA, the designer, Joe No, I don't do this, because this is not an English class. This is a knowledge class. We just use English as a tool to teach you how to, how teach you to understand the complexity and the beauty of international affairs, okay? So you will see the structure of the PPTT is quite different from other reading class. We don't do that, and we only do this. Okay, so you can use that. Okay, so look here. Joe's store was still under renovation, and the actor Pee Wee Herman, wow, <laughs> the good one, right? So could you check it out, Pee Wee Herman, to see his face throughout your, your, your cell phone? To see who he is. So, did you see his funny nose? He is a comedian and uh, just having fun, right? <laughs> so, this is the one. So, uh, Pee Wee Herman walked in and asked for a couple of pairs, still under construction. The inside decoration was still on the process. And the uh, Herman walked into, hey, buddy, hey, man, can I have a pair of the shoes? Okay. So by the end of 1995, hush puppies were once again a staple of the wardrobe of the young American male. So if I have something I want to keep for my shoes, I need to have a pair of hush puppies. That is the common sense at that time. Is a must. Is a must, uh, must stuff that I have to keep. So in 1995 and in 1996, let's look at here. So funny. In 1996, the sale of the hush puppies has reached to 1.8 million, right? So let's look at what happened to the company. Hush puppies won the prize for the best accessory at the Council of Fashion Designers. Right. 1994, hush puppy shoes almost died out. In 1994, 1996, the company who sells the, who sells the shoes won the award for the best accessory. And uh, you see the information provided within the parentheses, Xiao Hua Hu, offering the company admitted that such happening had nothing to do with their efforts. They did not do anything. They did not do anything, but they won the best designer of accessory. So strange, right? The only thing they could do is shrug their shoulders and, wow, what happened to me? What heck? Is that right? So funny. So this is who prepared the sale of hush puppies. Don't know, I'm certain. No idea. Okay, let's move to solve the mystery for the crime rate of New York City. Then who lowered the crimes in New York City? <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Not sure. Who should have the credits? No idea. Okay, let's look at the explanation here. First one. Normally, when we see the crime dropped, there must be some efforts from the, from the other factors, right? So now we have the so-called conventional wisdom. Conventional explanations include, wow, it was police. Oh, it was uh, the decline of crack trade. Oh, it was the greater improvement of the economy. 
these are the conventional wisdom explanation. So let's look at how they explain. The police say, because we have a better policing strategy. Look here, in five years, we have put more resources in the policing strategies, and we keep our presence on the street. So the citizens are helped, were helped when they are needed, when they need our help. So we are there for, to assist our people. So it is our credit. This is coming from the police force, right? And how about criminologists? So let's look here, Crim crime, bad happening, right? So Fan Zhe criminologists. So no, 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 it is not due to, it, the credit cannot only go to the police. The other factor is because the crack, the crack trade has been declined. <coughs> no one wants to sell, no one wants to sell the drugs because they will be caught. They will be put in the jail. Oh, worse, they will be killed. <coughs> so they don't want to do this. And the other one is the aging of the population <laughs> because people are getting old. So when people are getting old, what would they do? They would rather lie on the beach than go on the street to fight, right? So if you are old, you will stay at home and watch TV. You don't want to go on the street, too dangerous. Although, when you were young, you would kill and shoot and kick, right? But when you are old, you will just sit there and watch TV and pep to your dog. That's the aging of the population and uh, the decline of crack trade are the reasons for the drop of the crime in New York City. Police say something. Criminologists say something. But the, how about economists? Economists have their explanation too. They said it is because the greater improvement in the city's economy over the course of the 1990s. See, people were better off. When you have more money, what would you do? Well, you will try to earn more money and try to secure your own property, right? In this regard, you will not like to commit any more crime. You will like to go to work because you know you have a stable income, so you don't risk your family, your life, to get some random money from the street. Everyone is better off, so go home and watch TV <laughs> again, right? So in a, throughout the course of 1990s, the economy became better and better. So this one has the effect of employing those who might otherwise have become criminals. So look here. You may be the criminal, but now you are hired <laughs> because of the better economy. So instead of killing people on the street, you work on the factory to manufacture another pair of hot puppy shoes. Quite reasonable, right? This is not only happening in an individual level, it's a general phenomenon for everyone at that time. People have the opportunity, opportunity to get hired in the factory, so they don't have to kill other people. Sounds good. Look here, police, criminologists, economists, do they have all their own explanation, but those explanation sufficient to explain why the crime, why the decline of the crime rate in New York City is so fast? Not quite so. Let's, let's try to explain. Why such explanations insufficient? Not quite. Why? First one, let's look at the changes of drug trade, population, and the economy. They improved the economy and the aging population and the decline of drug trade. Basically, these are the so-called long-term trends. It does not change in, in just one year, okay? It changed, counted by decades, it's a long term. So it's hanging all over the country, and the most is not only happening in New York City. It also happened in, let's say, Detroit. 
Los Angeles, everywhere in the United States, all the major city, crime cities in the United States, right? But this one, we do see, we do see, in New York City, there's a sharper decline of crime rate, okay? So crime plunged, plunged in New York City much more than in other cities in the country. Did you see this one? That is, we know drug trade is declined, economy is improved, people are getting old. But this is a common phenomenon for all the cities. But it only happened in New York, we see the plunge of the crime rate, but not in other cities. So this is not the reason, the primary reasons, right? If these reasons can stand true, then the crime rate of all other cities should do the same thing. But they don't. That did not happen in this way, okay? And the other one is that we know this is a long-term trend, right? But let's see what happened in New York. It happened in just five years. So why it all happened in such an extraordinary short time? People five years ago and five years later now, I'm still me, right? I don't feel exhausted. Five years ago, I, I believe that my energy level is about the same as I am, am now. So it does not change that fast. But the other questions, the three long-term trend cannot explain why it happened in such a short manner, right? So we have a C, two major concerns. Economy, drug trade, and the aged population cannot be used to explain why the crime rate in New York City plunges so fast, but it does not happen in other cities. No more. And the second one cannot explain is that why it happens so quick. Why? Cannot, right? Okay. And this is the, this is provided, this too is, uh, this is provided by economists and criminalists, right? Criminologists. But how about the police? Okay, let's look at the improvements by the police. We look here. They are important, of course. We cannot deny that. Police should do something. And they have done something, make something happen. Everyone feels happy. But a puzzling gap between the scale of changes in policing and the size of the effects on places like uh, Brownsville and the East New York, still there. For example, we look here. The crime rate, the murder rate dropped from 1992 around more than, a little bit more than 2000 to 1997 a little bit less than 800, right? But we do not see the police force expand with the same quantity. For example, previously in 1992, the police force in New York City is 10,000. But it's not possible for us to see in 1997, the police force is 50,000. It's not possible. It's not possible, right? So look here. Crime didn't just slowly act in New York City as conditions gradually improved. It plummeted. It dropped so quickly. So it's very difficult to imagine how hard the police force can be contributed to this happening. Yes, indeed, we have to admit they have improved their strategy. They have, to pro they have already provided much better services to the people. But all of this is a slow improvement. You cannot just suddenly push in, the, drive the tanks into the city and shoot everyone who try to commit crime. Cannot do this. So it's not slowly change the crime rate but the crime rate is sudden just plummet. Okay, so let's see this one. So now we have a three conventional explanation, right? This one, policing strategy, the declining of crack trade and aging population, and also the economy improvement. <coughs> 
They are important, they are not, but they are not sufficient to provide full explanation for the sharper, <coughs> for the sharp decline of the crime rate in New York. So let's ask, <coughs> all of this, how can a change in a handful of economic state and social indices? Economic and social indices refers to the strategy, characterized aging population, economy, and so on. Cost murder rates to fall by two thirds in five years. This is the main issue we have to concern, right? So all the conventional explanations are not quite enough to explain why the crime rate dropped so fast in New York City. So that's why we not so sure. We have no idea at all, right? Okay, so let's try to identify the very reasons for the happenings of these two issues. Okay, so what about the answer? Well, the answer lies on the magical word we call the tipping point. The tipping point. What is the tipping point? The tipping point is the biology of an idea. Okay, what is biology? The life story, right? So it is the life story of an idea. An idea, when it is very small, it has the process to evolve. The process of evolution of this idea is the tipping point. So it explain, it describes the full process of how an idea can prosper, how an idea can grow so fast and so big, so influential. Just like, hey, let's go to where a hot pair of house puppies. This is an idea, right? This is an idea. But how can you are a fact, how can you be affected by this idea and go to the store to buy an, your own very pair of hush puppies? Right? So this is the idea. The idea can travel. The idea can grow. Sometimes one idea grows very slow and eventually no one cares and just dies out. Sometimes an idea can grow from a very small starting and uh, grow very fast and grow very popular and everyone just want to have a piece of the idea. So this is the tipping point. Okay, so the tipping point, how simple it is. Let's look at here. When we say ideas and products and messages and the behaviors can spread just like viruses do. Can spread out. And everyone, oh, this is a good idea, so I will take it, right? I will take it. Oh, the pair of hush puppy shoes, oh, so cool, so unique, so different. I will take it. Oh, let's go home, watch TV, don't commit any more crime. Mm. That is a good idea, so let's go home. Idea. And the behaviors of going home may be contagious for another people, another person to take. So, oh, you go home, you go to home to watch TV. Oh, today we have a crime party on the street, you don't want to join? Oh, no, 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 I, I don't want to go. Okay, you don't want to go, and I don't want to go either. So, you go your home, and I go back to my home, and we watch TV. So, this is the idea and behavior, right? So, if you accept this idea, then the idea will spread. The behavior will spread, right? So this is the idea we call the tipping point. So let's look deeper into the idea of the tipping point. The tipping point help us understand any number of other mysterious changes that mark everyday life is to think of them as epidemics. What is epidemics? Liu Xingbing. Something viruses do, just like COVID-19, right? Let's look at this. COVID-19 is a small virus. Starts somewhere, uh, we don't know where, but starts with a very, very small location. But it explodes. It sprays with a very quick manner. 
If you are contacted by the virus, you got infected, right? Then you have COVID-19. And then you will spread that virus to other people. So basically, when we say tipping point, tipping point can help us to understand why some events can spread so fast. For example, there are some events happening all the time through our times in our society. For example, the emergence of fashion trends. Look at yourself. You are following some kind of fashion trends, right? And uh, just about decades ago, and the students love, with, love to wear um, shirts or pants with a lot of holes on it, right? But if we push back 20 years ago, you have different fashion. But now, it seems like your shirt is shorter than shorter with a belly button in front. That is the fashion show. Why do you want to take this? Why? Because you are infected with the virus of this is good. <laughs> the virus, you are infected. So you believe that this is good, something just over there, right? And the ebb and flow of crime waves. Well, sometimes people love to commit crime, but some other times people just like to stay at home because they accept the idea, oh, we need to do this. And, with, uh, and about 40 years ago, 40 years ago in Japan, have you ever heard about the Sankozu? as the biggest mafia, the gangster in Japan, right? The youngster at that time was so eager to join the, the gang. Why? Because they believe that it's kind of fashion. That's good. But now, what about Sankozu? The members of Sankozu are all the people around 60, 70, and 80 years old. No, young, no younger generation joined the party. People are different. And how about the transformation of our non-books into bestsellers? Okay, so you will see, you will see that there are some mysterious, one book was sold in the market, maybe it's for decades, no one cared. But suddenly people just rush in to the buy the books from the stores. And the rise of teenage smoking. Sometimes, we have no idea. And the phenomenal word of mouth and so on. Oh, this is good, let's go to buy. Oh, the cafeteria just opened on the corner of the street, so good, let's go there, right? So you may just, oh, this is a good idea, let me go there. If you go there, you will tell the other students, your other friends, so let's all go there. Then people just rush in there and get a line, long line over there, right? When one, when one store is open, you will see a lot of line. People lying on the street, right? And just look at the, what is special for today, and just go there. This can explain. So this is the so-called tipping point. Then let's go further to understand. We use the tipping point to understand the commonality of the two cases, the rise of harsh puppies and the decline, the drop of the crime rate in New York City. Let's see this one. Basically, these two examples are the so-called textbook examples of epidemics in actions. Epidemics in actions both share a very basic underlying pattern, although the two events happen in different way, right? But, but strangely, strangely enough, they share three commonality, three. And this is the very characteristics of the tipping point. Now, let's take a look. Three, one is contagiousness. The other one is the little change can cause a big effect. And the third part is the changes happening in a hurry, but not in a slow motion. Okay, so we will continue to explain the three different characteristics. The three common patterns are the very characteristics of the tipping point. Okay, let's go to the first one, contagiousness. 
hash puppy. Hash puppy, let's look here. First of all, no advertisement, no nothing at all telling people, hey, you should buy the traditional hash puppies. That were cool. Go there, it's so cool, right? Just Nike, just do it, right? Just do it, so everyone just do it. So you would like to have a pair of Nike shoes. But Hush Puppy offering did nothing to promote the sale. The company did not tell, tell the, the people, tell people that the, the, the shoes were so cool, so you need to have a pair. No. Kids, simply wore the shoes when they went to clubs or cafe, or walk the street, or downtown New York. They just wore it, because it just wore it. And in doing so, look here, exposed other people to their the fashion sense, their fashion sense about wearing this kind of shoes. And this kind of fashion sense has the ability to infect other people with the, the so-called hush puppy virus. <laughs> so look here, they walk on the street wearing hush puppy shoes. So their fashion sense infected other people to have the same fashion shoes of hush puppy, wearing hush puppy. So let's just call it as the hush puppy virus. So other people are infected by hush puppy virus. So they will go to the store and do, oh, I need to have a pair of hush puppy shoes. Oh, I'm sick. I need to have a pair. Oh, good. So once they, are, they wear the same shoes, the other people got infected too, right? So contagiousness. That's incredible, right? And let's look at the crime rate, the crime decline in New York. The crime rate decline, the crime decline in New York was not, it's not some huge percentage of would-be murderers suddenly set up in 1993 and decided not to commit any more crimes. <laughs> no, it's not happening in this case, right? And all that the police Manage magically to intervene in a huge percentage of situation that would otherwise have turned deadly. So the two possibilities are not there. One possibility is that it just happened a huge percentage of the criminals suddenly stand up and say, hey, we don't want to commit more crime. No, it's not happening this way. Or the second happening possibility is the police just happen magically whenever, wherever there would be a crime happening on the street, they were there. No, it does not happen this way, right? <coughs> Instead, it was because of the reasons. There are three very small reasons. First one, a small number of the people in a small number of the situations in which the police or the new social forces had some impact, started at behaving very differently. You were the crime, you were the would-be criminals, or you were the criminals before, right? But suddenly, a very small portion of the people, the criminal, would-be criminal, that thought, oh, maybe, uh, I, need, I need to take a break today, <laughs> right? Need to take a break today. Okay, so this kind of people has a need to take a break virus. Overall, it would be much easier to take rest instead of fighting life or death on the street, right? So how about take a break? And that kind of behavior somehow spread to other would-be criminals in similar situations. And somehow, a large number of people in New York got infected <laughs> with this kind of the so-called anti-crime violence in a short time. 
See, this kind of anti-crime violence, it always started with a very small handful of criminals, right? So they just thought, oh, come on. I was too tired today. Take a break. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go to rob the bank. Quitting for a day, take a vacation. So this kind of anti-crime virus would infect other people, other criminals. Okay, let's take a break, and uh, we shall come back in 10 minutes. Okay, please take your seat as soon as possible. Okay, let's resume our class, and uh, this is the... So as we can see this, hush puppies, uh, it just happened there's a hush puppy virus. And for the crime decline in New York City, we saw an incident of the anti-crime virus. So other people will got, will Will, got, will get infected by this kind of viruses, so they will do the same thing. They will rush into the park and mall store to buy hush puppy shoes. And those, who for those would be criminals, when they got infected by the anti-crime virus, they would just stay at home and they just watch TV <laughs> and, quitting, and quit committing more crime for just for today. After today, how about tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, they will say, oh, okay, that may be a good idea to just stay at home and uh, watch t a lot of TVs, right? Okay, so contagiousness is one of the major characteristics of the tipping point. And let's look at the other one. The other characteristics of the tipping point is little changes with big effects. So there's a difference between little and big, right? So let's look at hush puppies. Let's ask one question. How many kids we are talking about who began wearing the shoes in downtown Manhattan? 20, 50, 100 at the most? Basically not too many, right? A handful of kids refers to around 2050, something like that, right? So it does not need to start big. Just like virus, it always start with a very small location, right? Okay, yet, yet the action seems to have single-handedly started an international fashion trend. Everyone loves to have a pair of hush puppies, fashion trend, universal, uh, worldwide, international, global, wow, great. Everyone has to appear of the shoes because everyone is infected by the virus. So little changes with big effects. Starting from a very small handful of kids, they have hush puppy viruses and uh, eventually reach to a very large population because those people have infected by the so-called hush puppy viruses too. <coughs> Just like uh, this one, right? This epidemic we have facing now, everyone has to wear masks. And uh, a lot of people in Taiwan, more than now, more than six million people have been infected by COVID-19. A lot of people, right? So small start, big effects. How about New York? crime decline. Let's look at all possible reasons for changes that happened at the margin. Yeah, we know economy, the aging population, the crack threat, or the improved the policing strategy. They cannot ju just happen in the mainstream of the city. No. It happened in the margin. They were incremental changes, small changes, right? Just piece by piece. Maybe there's a, there were two more policemen walking the street instead of one. 
uh, maybe they are they were uh, earning more, people are earning more a little bit more money week by week, and maybe people are increasing the number of uh, stay at home watch TV. It is incremental, slow change. Cannot happen just one day. Let's say, uh, in day one, uh, uh, there were suddenly two thousand people decided to stay at home and watch TV, and two days later, and become two million. No, it does not happen this way. Always start with a very very small fashion. So look here, the population got a little older. The crack trade leveled off. Yes, it decreased a little bit. And the police force got a little better. Only everything is a little bit incremental. Yet the effect was dramatic. We see the effect. Eventually, people died fewer, much fewer than five years ago, right? So this is a dramatic result. So let's see the second characteristics of the tipping point is the little changes can have a very big effects. And how about the third one? The third one is changes happening in a hurry, not in a slow fashion, but just uh, in a very quick fashion, in a hurry. Let's look at hush puppies. Hush puppies, how many are we talking about who begin wearing the shoes in, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's bad. So change is happening in a hurry. Hush puppies, let's look at hush puppies. A $30 pair of shoes went from a handful of downtown Manhattan hipster and designers to every mall in America. So it's a very small beginning to uh, every mall in America, right? So and its sale went from 30,000 to more than millions in a space just in two years. Two years. So you see change is happening in a hurry, right? So let's look at the COVID-19 just about three years ago, right? But now everywhere. Three years ago, but now everywhere. And the crime decline in New York. Let's see this. In 1965, this is the crime number. Doubled in two years. Quickly doubled in two years. And continue almost unbroken until it hit 650,000 crimes a year in the mid-1970s. And it stayed there, stayed at the level for the next two decades. And then, plunge downward in 1996, 1992, as sharply as it rose 30 years ago. Let me draw a picture for you. You could have a good idea about what happened to this. So, first one, this is 1965. This is about 200,000. So this is the number. But if, let's look here. In 1970s, so this is 1970s, starting up twice, two and more than that over here, and harbor around there. So look here, in just in about five years, shooting into the sky, start from 200,000 to around 650,000 in the 1970s. And uh, hovered there for more than two decades. Only at in 1992, it just suddenly dropped. Here comes the questions. Why? Why? Is that right? It's happening so fast. So fast. Okay, so basically we have summarized the three major characteristics of the tipping point. One, it is contagious. Second, it always starts with a very small beginning and ends with a very huge effect, big effect. Number three, the process of it becoming so huge is fast. So that's why Hush puppy viruses can do the wonder. And how the anti-crime virus can do the job. It's not because suddenly, suddenly thought they should stay at home. 
No, they don't do this. It's not because uh, people suddenly believe that hush puppy shoes is so good. No, it's not. Just because it is a virus. It's after, once you got infected, you have a pair of hush puppies. Once you got infected by the anti-crime virus, you would rather stay at home and watch TV. Very simple. And now, let me introduce another kind of virus for you. It's good to study hard the virus. It's not bad to study a little bit more virus, right? So look here, you are college kids. You're now in college, so why not just start a bit, little bit? Well, maybe it's good to study. <laughs> it's good to study virus. Then maybe you could start with you, and then your team members, and then everyone else in the department say, oh, Oh, you study, my goodness. Hmm, maybe I, I could go home and study. And instead of playing game, instead of smoke some cigarettes on the corner of the street, seriously, uh, mysterious, hiding from all the eyes of friends or parents, maybe it's good to be a kid, right? <laughs> so let's have, uh, it's good to study heart virus embedding your heart, maybe just start with uh, you, from you. So that's why we always try to introduce some of the good elements for you to keep. You know, it's never to be too late to make some changes. You never know whether this kind of, it's good to study how the virus can be the tipping point for your life. Who knows? Who knows? Try to do something. Try to do something for yourself, okay? So this is the tipping point, it's the one dramatic moment in an epidemic when everything can change all at once. There are three characteristics. We have a contagiousness, the effect that little changes can cause have big effects. And the final part is change happens not gradually, but the one dramatic moment. So this the characteristics of the tipping point. Of course, of the three, the third trait, the idea that epidemics can rise and fall in one dramatic moment is the most important. If that is too slow, then that is not an epidemic, right? It's at best, it's a flu, <laughs> no one cares. Uh, because it is the principle. That makes sense of the first two. It has to be quick. It has to be quick. That permits the greatest insight into why modern change happens in the way it does. We have, a seen, we have seen a lot of changes, right? For example, like you. Younger generations love to use iPhone instead of that's a Android phone. And uh, just a few days ago, I heard one student told me, Daniel, don't you think you're too old? I we'll say, why? Look at yourself, you're using Android. What's wrong with my Android? We all use iPhone. Oh, that's great, but what's, what's the problem? So you guys are infected by iPhone virus, I'm not. I'm immune with phone the virus. But I prefer to have the Piso, okay? The, mine is a Piso Pro 6. I love this. I'm waiting for Piso 9 to buy another one, but not iPhone. It doesn't matter whether it's iPhone 20, 25, 30, 35. I don't care. Piso is good. I am infected by Piso virus. This is one, this is a very small virus. Has no power infecting you. <laughs> I know that. But it's okay. It's okay, right? So every generation has different idea, different kind of viruses. Your body characteristics are, are, are very capable of receiving this kind of iPhone viruses, not me. But it's okay. So let me introduce, introduce you one more time. Remember the virus I gave you to you? It's good to study hard virus. Okay, try that. Okay, so let's talk about etymology for now. Uh, in the test, we have uh, several paragraphs like this. They weren't deliberately trying to promote hush puppies. The fate, the fat spreads to 
two fashion designers who used the shoes to pedal something else. The shoes were an incidental touch. The shoes passed a certain point in popularity and they tipped. So the bold faced words can be understood from the perspective of that etymology. Let me give you some explanation for this one. The first one, deliberately. Deliberately, that means you do this on purpose. On purpose. Why? Because you are not free to make your own choice. So look here, we have a liber. Liber. If we liberate, we set someone else free, right? Liberate. Or if you are a liberal, let's say we put an end here, liberal. Means you are not a conservative. You are a person with a liberal mind. You are not conservative, right? So deliberately, means that the away or off, you are away from the freedom. So you are not allowed to do this. So when we say deliberately refers to on purpose. You do this on purpose. Okay, because you have no choice. You have to do this. And the other one is pedal. Pedal, we use pet or foot. This is the meaning for foot, use your foot. So look here, pedestrian. Pedestrian, this is the foot, right? And I-A-N means person, people. So this is a person walking on feet. So ren, right? Pedestrian, okay. so. And we know that P-O-D, P-O-D, P-E-D refers to the same meaning for foot. How about this? Podium. I-U-M refers to some place, some place. So this is the place for foot. What is this? Means Jiang Tai. This is the place for my feet. So this is podium, okay? And I-U-M, I-U-N is the place of the container, right? So let's look at, can we use I-U-M to expand to into another vocabulary? Let's look at the stadium. What is stadium? Stayed means stand, stand. So stadium is the place for competition. If you were the audience in the stadium, you would rather stand up instead of sit there, right? Because so the game is so exciting. So you will stand up and shout, go, right? So this is the stadium, Jing Ji Chang, stadium. And how about auditorium? Auditorium, we see the I-U-M again, right? How about old? Old means here. So, so A-U-D refers to here. And we know I-T or I-T-I is to go to go. So auditorium refers to a place for you to go to hear some music. Auditorium. Or some speech. Auditorium. So you can see that they are all related. So whenever you see IUM, you know it refers to something, some place or some container. For example, aquarium. Aquarium. This is the place 
for water. Aqua, A-Q-U-A, refers to water. So aquarium has two meanings. This is a place exhibiting fish, crafts, marine life for you. So this is a huge place, right? Oh, aquarium is a container for fish. Yu gang, or sui zu guan, right? So it can have two meaning. Can have two meaning. So this is aquarium. Okay, so this is petal, and how about the other one, incidental? Incidental come out from CID. CID refers to fall. So when we say incidental, it means to just fall into here. Something falling into here, it just happened. So it is an incident. It is an event. Is that right? And we know CAS, CID, CAD, or CAS is to fall, right? So let's look at another word, for example, how about this one? Cascade. What is cascade? Cascade is four and four, right? <laughs> you can see the four and four. It's a waterfall. Waterfall is cascade. Pupu, cascade. So remember, you can use a lot of knowledge for word for this kind of roots to explain your knowledge for vocabulary. It's very easy. Uh, the more you know, the, the happier you will feel. Oh, pupu the pu. Pu. <laughs> okay. Oh, you can say waterfall. That like we find too. Waterfall. Waterfall is another word. Waterfall is another poop poop. So cascade. Cascade is more uh, elegant word, but waterfall is <laughs> known by others. Okay. So, and the last one is popularity. Popularity comes out from the people, populace. So full of people refers to the popularity, right? Of the people. You are among the people. So you are welcomed by the people. So you are popular. Popular. Popular of the people. And IT1 refers to some kind of status or condition. So this is the condition of the people. You are welcomed by the people, so you are full of popularity. So it's good to learn some roots, right? And uh, from the first quiz, I noticed uh, some students did not pay attention to uh, remember, try to do the work by yourself. The vocabulary list over there include uh, the meaning of the words in Chinese and English, and also the meaning of the roots inside the, the word. So you have to spend some time to read it. Or otherwise, you have no idea about the meaning and you have no ability to answer the questions. And remember, it constitutes for 40 points. Is that right? So you want to earn some points. Or otherwise, I will send you <coughs> the updated score for you every week. And you will know the progress of your learning. And remember, by the end of the semester, you have tried hard, I have tried hard. If your score is 59, then that is 59. Okay? There's no way to move up to 60. No. So it is, uh, you have to keep your own discipline. Remember, because I have dutifully, I will be dutifully keep you updated and informed about your progress. So you have to study. So let's have the, it's good to study hard virus in our heart, okay? <laughs> okay, so etymology. And next, let's move to uh, sentence structure. It, mo it meant no sense to them that shoes that were so obvious out of fashion could come back, could, could make a comeback. So this one it seems, uh, seems very long, right? 
Then, what is the subject for this one? Anyone knows the subject for this one? So let's uh, try to do this again. Okay, now type in your answer. Rocco again, what is the subject for the sentence of the slide? Maybe I should give you a clear idea. It meant no sense to them that shoes that were so obviously out of fashion could make a comeback. <laughs> Very long. I uh, remember uh, you have to make your own judgment. Don't just copy and paste, okay? Okay, in five minutes, uh, <laughs> sorry, five seconds, I will end the roll call for this time. Okay, no more answers? Okay, now I end here. Okay, it's not shoes, it's not, uh, it is it, but <laughs> not uh, anything else, okay? So, uh, the subject for this one is it. And uh, the verb, chastity verb is made. The object is sense, okay? So that's it, it made sense. So this is a core com component for this one. All else are modifiers, but something you have to remember, that is, it refers to, it refers to that shoes that was so obviously out of fashion could make a comeback, the thing. This is the thing, this is the whole issue, refers to it. Okay? So basically, can we change the sequence of the sentence and use this as the subject, the whole non clause as a sentence, as the subject? Yes but it will be too long, too tedious to read. Let me give you the order of the new sentence. That is, that shoes that were so obviously out of fashion could make a comeback, made no sense to them. Which means that we could, of course, we could relocate the whole non clause being zi put here and take this away, and this is the subject, right? And the made no sense to them. So we just change the order and put this in the back. So that shoes, that was so obviously out of fashion, could make a comeback, made no sense to them. Yes, of course, but, but, in our formal communication, English language is for communication, right? If I, if I usually, I always put a, such a long, a very long, a very long noun clause in the beginning as the subject, then it will be very confusing for the listeners, right? For you. So gradually, the grammatical structure, people are used to put an it, we call shu zhu ci, to represent the noun clause here. So it represents this, right? So in the idea of grammatical structure, basically, 
This one is the modifier for it. Ah, I'm sorry, a positive tong wei yu for it. Because they are equal. They are equal. This is the a positive for it. You know it? Okay? So whenever we use it, make no sense to them. We will be wondering what does it represent? And then you give your reader say, wait, I'll tell you what the meaning for it. The meaning for it is that shoes were so obviously out of fashion can make a comeback. So this is it. So basically for the re from the reader's perspective, it will be much easier for them to follow your logic by indicating it in the very beginning. That's why we have this kind of structure, right? Okay, so now, let's move to the structure here. As you can, it's more complicated, right? <laughs> a little bit more complicated. But, but, but let's take a look. Let's take a look. Do you see, this is the main nine, right? Still the main nine, right? See it? And did you see it? The subject. Made, transitive verb. And the sense, oops, this is wrong. We do not have this. Okay, so it meant sense. Sense, what kind of sense? No sense, so that's why we have a modifier here, right? No is used to modify sense, so it's put under with a backslash. And made no sense to them is a uh, prepositional phrase to modify made. So basically, decoration and decoration, right? Now, let's look at it. It is equal to the whole structure here. And uh, did you see this one? This is that, right? With the dotted line, it refers to, it says, it is equal to the segment here, because this is connected by that. Okay, so that, what is the non cross here? Shoes could make comeback. Let's look at here. Shoes could make comeback. So let's see the subject in the non cross is shoes, right? Could make comeback. So let's see this one. Shoes could make comeback. Shoes could make come back. Do you see the relation between this? So how many come back? Uh, so there's only one. Modify come back. Could make. And shoes is modified by that were so obviously out of fashion. So you can see this one is used to modify shoes, right? So look here, another one. <laughs> yeah. This one is used to that we were out of that were out of fashion so obviously is used to modify shoes. This is the so-called sentence diagramming. Sentence diagramming can help you to understand the structure of the sentence very easily. So now I want you to use your cell phone to check the words again. Sentence diagram. Now, do it. Sentence diagram, D-I-A-G-R-A-M-M-I-N-G, or sentence diagram. Check it out to give you some idea about what kind of knowledge you could explore by yourself. Sentence diagramming. Hurry up, do it.
So you can see uh, the first search I have here is everything you need to know about sentence diagramming with examples. Is that right? This is my. I have found that. It will be very easy if you want. The practice I want you to do is to just give you some idea. If you don't know something, you can check it out by yourself. You can go there to learn something by yourself. This is part of the educational process for a college student. Never rely on, only rely on your teachers to provide you the knowledge you need to enrich yourself. You need to explore the knowledge by yourself. So now I want you to another exercise. That is, please share the link of your finding into our night group. So I know you have identified some website you can learn something. For example, I can do this by myself right now. I can share. So I can share the link to our night group. So let's see our night group is here, so share. So here I have my first sharing of the link. So you have to do this now, okay? No, oh, great, we have seen some students do this. For those students are still napping, you have to do that, or otherwise I will deduct your points. <laughs> You have to do the, this. Hurry up. Doing this, this is very simple. Of course, you could go there to explore some knowledge by yourself, to prepare yourself for full knowledge. Is that right? Okay, I'm going to end this in this one. Okay, so I'm going to start. If you still want to upgrade, you could do that as soon as possible, and no, okay. Thank you. So asking you to do this is not because I want to check on you, no. It just give you some idea. Learning process depends on yourself a lot. From now on, you will, you, will experience, you will be experiencing a lot of difficulties, a lot of questions, a lot of puzzlements out there. Who can help you? Of course, you can come to my office and ask, Daniel, what is this, what this is? And uh, the quickest way is that you just go there and uh, explore the knowledge you need to learn. So a literature review is an integral part of college learning. Trust me. You have to learn by yourself, okay? And now, this is sentence structure, and that's, you see, it is very long. This is a very long sentence, right? But if you dissect the sentence into a very core components, the very simple component is just it made sense. That's it. It made sense. All else are modifiers, are decorations, are something you can take away, right? Okay, so let's move to the others. We have uh, three assignments. The first one is people from different generations have their specific taste of, of A ties. And do you think that most of the old people would like to have a pair of hush puppies? Why and why not? So yeah, of course you have to discuss. You could discuss with your team members and try to figure out. And uh, there's no definite answer. Don't try to look for, it must be yes, because Daniel is old. <laughs> so I have to please him. No, don't do this. College writing is about to express your opinion first, and substantiate your opinion with evidence and your own argument. So you have to identify, you have to indicate whether you believe that it is or not, and provide reason for why and why not, okay? 
So don't try to become a copycat because everyone else says this. So I need to say the same thing. No, don't do this. You have to express your own opinion and uh, support your opinion with your own evidences and arguments. Number two, it's about crime, now and then. Brownsville and East New York were once two of the most dangerous boroughs in the U.S., where most people would take to the safety of their apartment at nightfall. Today, they seem significantly different. You can see here, I don't hear any gunfire anymore, says Inspector Maserati. The commanding officer of the police precinct in Brownsville. Okay, this is the background information, right? So here is the assignment for you. I want you to explore solid evidence to decide whether these two boroughs have indeed moved on to a positive direction. And where can you find out this kind of evidence? Of course, you have to search the information, right? and try to come out with some of the literature and read and learn whether today these two boroughs are indeed in a better fashion. Tell me, you have to provide your own arguments. Of course, you can discuss first. And remember, you have to write your own arguments with your own writing. Never copy in the past. And number three. Number three requirements. You you have to work with your team members to figure out how to answer the two and uh, synthesize your comments in your own words in the Google Docs. Oh, I will not provide you this. Instead of Google Docs, you just write your drafts on your own textbooks, okay? And remember, you do not need to provide any, any writings back to me. You don't. You only write on your own books and uh, Professor Xie will come to inspect every, uh, once you were assigned there, then you will be inspected for your note taking, okay? This is for your own preparation, not for you to show how much you have done. You don't need to do this, but this is part of your note taking efforts, okay? And you need to answer the TOEFL questions, and uh, I will be welcoming for your questions next time? Any questions so far? So if not, let's uh, come back to our selection of the test group. Uh, look here, we have a random number here, right? And uh, the way we choose our 60 students is like this. I will click here, and you see the ranking system is different, right? So people are different. So basically, I will select the first 60 students as the formal candidate to take the tests. To take the test. And I will, the other students will be arranged with the sequence as the backup. That is, when the 60, some of the 60 students are not able to take the test on the designed date because of sickness, or some other urgent matters, the backup students will move up. And in total, there will be two tests. One test will be taken on October 12th. That is uh, one Wednesday, today is 27th, right? So we will have the test here today, two weeks from now, two weeks from now. And the other test will somewhere before the end of the semester. And it is good for you in two ways. One, you can use the test to understand your real English proficiency level. Because there is a pretest, October 12th, and the uh, final test somewhere between before the end of the semester. So this is only for you to verify the level of your English proficiency. This is not count as part of your scores for this class. Okay, so don't worry. You just go there to take the test, have fun. 
other than have fun, there is a two, the second point you may consider. That is, if you meet up some criteria of the test, then you will be awarded uh, some money from the school. I heard from somewhere, if you reach B2 level, you may have $1,000 for the reward. And uh, it's unlimited. It doesn't matter how many students get to the level. It's up to you. It's all. So you will get some money. That is good, right? So there are two points. One, you could use the occasion to verify your English proficiency level. Second, you can use this opportunity to earn some extra cash, to buy some extra meals of McDonald's, or to treat your girlfriend or boyfriend some meals altogether, or enjoy some movie. Okay, so I'm going to randomize the student here. I will cl click three times, so uh, let's have some fun. So here, one, and uh, two, and uh, three. Okay, so here are the students. We are going to take the test. And uh, now I'm going to give the order of the students who should be taking the test. One, two. Okay, so let's uh, do this. So all the students above will be taking, will be the formal candidates to take the tests. And the students below will become the, become the backup students. So now, first, let's take a look at the students here. Anyone here want to be the volunteer? You can raise your hands. Let me, the students here in the list are the backup students. If you want to be the volunteer, then you can say, you want to be the one to join the party? These are the backup students. And here are the students who are formally invited. <laughs> no, they are not invited. You are designated to get into. So these are the students and uh, required to take the test. Yeah. Okay, later, later I will tell you how, how this works, okay? So we have a formal list, we have a backup list, right? If you want to, basically, if you are elect, selected as the member for the formal list, unless someone wants to take in, you have no way to get out. You could, of course, indicate you don't want to take the test, so you just type in here. I don't want to take the test if you are in a formal group. If you are in the backup group, you could indicate I want to take the test. So let me give you I don't want to take the test. This if you are in the formal list. You just say this, I don't want to take this. And the next one, if you are in the backup list, you can uh, take me in. Okay, so there are only two expressions for you. you, you can do that. And remember, if you are in the formal list, unless someone else are out there, and then you could be exempt from the selection, okay? And the other one, if you are native speaker for English, you don't need to take. Jamie, are you? 
You are native speaker. Okay, so you are exempt from this one. Okay, and remember, we need, we do need, and all the applicants applying for get in or get out were determined by randomization. So I will not put you on the order, but it was randomization. And after I finish finalize all the list, I was create two individual groups, and I will invite you to get in. And from now on, I will tell you the further information from our individual night group. Okay, so you still have time to express your opinion before 12.10. Now dismiss and have fun. Thank you very much, goodbye. Say thank you. Yes, thank you, virus. Okay. Professor. Professor, may I have your book? 247? 247. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you for your tip. Yeah. 没关系啊,我们刚才不是有抽吗?有两组,这一组是要加进来要参加那个英文测验的。啊，这一组是不参加英文测验的。啊，你如果说被抽到这边的话，你可以，你若不想参加，你可以打说“I don't want to take the test”。I don't want to take the test. Yes, 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 但是這個要進來你就進來就好了就考考Pearson英文測驗Pearson英文測驗這個不錯啦我跟你講不用錢在外面考了兩三千一次不會完全不會我也換算成你只是讓你們知道自己成績程度怎麼樣你考得好還可
because it's 54. So are you on the list? Uh, so you have to take the test. I have to take the test? Yes. When? Uh, October 12th. October 12th? Yes. That's early, no? Uh, no. Uh, 307. Uh, you will be uh, informed, not okay. here. Yeah, don't worry. Just take. And uh, by the way, yeah. I believe that you could earn some extra cash. You know, it's just it's right. English. I'll just like me, uh, if I were taking the Chinese test, I'd love to. I would, yeah. I would what? like to take it. Which test is it? What kind of uh, test? Pearson, Pearson test. Pearson. Pearson test. All right. That's good, right? Yeah. Three thousand dollars at least, I think. Oh no, no winner. If you reach certain level, you will be awarded some cash. That's good. No, it's not easy to make some extra money here. Me too. Okay, have fun. Thank you.